including the one at which the member has made reference to. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, we learned that another 23,000 patients missed the so-called 12-week guarantee for NHS treatment in Scotland in the three months up to March. That's an utter disgrace. Indeed, under the current Health Secretary, the number of patients being seen within that alleged guaranteed time has fallen from 74% to just 68%. Be honest, how does the First Minister rate that performance? Yeah. First Minister. Well, we, we are all aware of the demographic reasons for increased pressure on NHS waiting times. That is exactly why this government, this Health Secretary, I think uniquely amongst the governments in the UK, is implementing an £850 million waiting time improvement plan. Obviously, it takes time for that plan to work. Uh, the Health Secretary has been clear that one of the priorities in the early stages of that plan is tackling the longest waits in the health service. And if Ruth Davidson uh, looks a bit more closely at the figures that were published this week, she will see the signs of early progress of the success of that plan. For example, uh, looking at the treatment time guarantee, there was an 8.5% reduction in the number of ongoing waits over uh, 12 weeks over the last quarter. Uh, outpatient waiting time performance, there was an improvement of five percentage points in the last quarter, and the total number of uh, new outpatients with waits over 12 weeks was reduced by almost 16%. And in diagnostics performance, uh, there was a just short of 6% percentage points increase with the number of ongoing waits over six weeks reduced by 21.7%. So in direct answer to Ruth Davidson's question, real progress is being made by this government and we will continue the hard work to continue that progress in the weeks and months to come. Ruth Davidson. The trouble with the improvement plan is that it was introduced six months ago and since then the headline figures have got worse, not better. And in fact, they are the worst they have ever been. And presiding officer, we've heard it all before because two years ago to this very day, the health secretary's predecessor announced a new £50 million investment plan to reduce waiting times that would, she said, reduce waiting times particularly when it comes to the 12-week guarantee for inpatient and day cases. Categorically wrong. So, given the failure of the previous plan, and given that the current plan is failing too, why should Scottish patients have any confidence in this government? Yeah. First Minister. Well, actually, the, the plan is, is not failing, and anybody who understands how uh, the health service operates and the integrated nature of it would understand that from the figures I've just read out. Uh, when you tackle the longest waits, particularly for outpatient treatment, uh, then you are putting more people into requiring uh, inpatient treatment. So you have the effect uh, on the figures that Ruth Davidson is talking about, but the underlying trend is in the right direction. So we're reducing uh, those that are waiting longest. And whether we're looking at outpatient performance, diagnostic testing performance, which is obviously of crucial importance, and inpatient uh, performance as well, we're seeing the numbers with ongoing long waits reducing. And of course, for outpatients and diagnostics, we've also seen an improvement in the last quarter on the headline figures as well. So the improvement plan is working, which is why we are going to stick with it, which is why we're going to continue to invest in that plan. And that's in stark contrast to what we're seeing elsewhere in the UK. I know the UK Health Secretary is visiting Scotland today. The same, the same UK Health Secretary who said that the UK government plans to reform social care have had to be put on the back burner because of Brexit. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't be able to invest £850 million in a waiting time improvement plan if we'd followed Scottish Conservative plans to give tax cuts to the very richest in our country. Ruth Davidson. And it's exactly those decisions of the UK government that means that there's an extra £2 billion for Scotland's NHS. And if the selective use of statistics by this government were a cure, then Scotland would be the healthiest country in the world. Absolutely. But the First Minister is conveniently forgetting the failure to meet the 18-week referral target, the one in five patients that are waiting too long for psychological therapy, the fewer than half of patients who are getting musculoskeletal services within four weeks, that almost a fifth of patients with urgent cancer referrals are waiting more than two months. But let me ask the First Minister a straight question. She says 
that by October of this year, in just four months' time, this government will ensure, absolutely ensure, that 75% of inpatients who are guaranteed to wait less than 12 weeks will fall within that guaranteed timescale. If the government fails to meet that target, will the Health Secretary keep her job? First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary... The, the Health Secretary is, is getting on with the job of delivering for patients. And the targets, the targets in the Waiting Times Improvement Plan, which are backed by the investment I've already spoken about, are targets this government is determined to deliver on. Uh, now, Ruth Davidson talks about uh, health funding. Uh, we have record health funding in Scotland. In fact, health spending in Scotland, and she may want to listen to this, right now is £185 per person higher than it is in England. That amounts to over a billion pounds yeah, extra yeah. being spelt in our health service here than if we uh, were to follow the levels in England. We've got record numbers of staff working in our National Health Service. Uh, Ruth Davidson mentioned cancer. 95% of people in Scotland rate their overall experience of cancer care uh, positively. And of course, in A and E, which is crucial to so many people across the country, Scotland's A and E services are the best performing yeah. in the UK, and they have been for four years running. Ruth Davidson. Sounds to me, presiding officer, that the health minister is keeping her job regardless. And the interesting thing is that that treatment time guarantee, a guarantee for every patient in Scotland, you might want to listen to this. Order, please. Order, please. Keep it down. Presiding officer, the treatment time guarantee has been breached 212,867 times since it was first introduced by one Nicola Sturgeon. That is 212,000 broken promises to patients from a government that puts the NHS second behind its own priorities. And if nobody is being held accountable, is it any wonder that those promises keep getting broken? Yeah. First Minister. Well, of course, since we introduced uh, the treatment time guarantee, 1,767,000 patients yeah. have been treated within it faster treatment yeah. than they would be getting yeah. uh, otherwise. And of course, uh, there has been in the last quarter that 8.5% reduction in the number of ongoing waits over 12 weeks. That is because this government is investing in the waiting times improvement plan and we will carry on uh, doing that. Uh, and this government uh, will dedicate our efforts to ensuring whether it's the health minister or any other minister that we meet uh, these targets. And you know, I'm not sure that ministers uh, resigning from governments, given the number that I've had to resign from the Conservative <laughs> government recently, is the strongest ground for Ruth Davidson to be on. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, can I refer members to my register of interests? In less than 60 minutes, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport will meet the Caledonian Railway Works stakeholder group. What is the Scottish Government's plan to save the Cali? First Minister. Well, as I have said openly, I've said it to uh, the trade unions, uh, we will always look for opportunities to uh, save companies, save plants, that are at risk of closure, but it will not always uh, be possible for us to do so. The Transport Secretary has been looking at all options over this and will, uh, as uh, Richard Leonard says, discuss that uh, shortly. But this government uh, has shown our willingness to intervene where it is possible in the interest of workers, but also uh, bearing in mind our responsibilities to the taxpayer to take action. We've done that with Bifab, we've done that uh, over the DL Steelworks, we did it with the aluminium smelter uh, in the north of Scotland. So this government will always be prepared to step in but we will always be uh, also honest with people where for whatever reason that is not possible and continue to work uh, with uh, unions and with companies and with workers to make sure we get the best possible outcomes. Richard Leonard. Well the honest experience for these working people is that yesterday morning they turned up to work to see a for sale sign nailed to the perimeter fence and tomorrow morning more workers will be issued with compulsory redundancy notices. The unions attending today's meeting told me, and I quote, we want to know what the Transport Secretary is going to do to save the site. Just last month, the current owners 
offered the depot to the government at no cost. In fact, they even promised to pay a nominal fee to facilitate it. But the Transport Secretary told the workers' representatives, we don't do nationalisation. First Minister, why is the Scottish Government ruling out purchasing this site and saving these jobs? First Minister. Well, firstly, it is obviously not true that this government doesn't do nationalisation. I seem to remember, uh, again, some criticism within this chamber. We nationalised Presswick Airport yeah, to stop it yeah. being closed. And we've been willing to step in. We've been willing to step in in other instances as well. Now, my, my understanding is that some of what Richard Leonard has put uh, to me today is not correct in terms of the offers the company has made but of course we are happy to have discussions uh, with the company and the Transport Secretary will continue to discuss the matter with trade unions. Uh, we will act where we can uh, to save companies from closure uh, as I have demonstrated with the examples I've already uh, used we've got a track record in doing that but we also have responsibilities to the taxpayer. We have uh, responsibilities to operate within the law on these matters. So it will not always be possible to do that. And where it is not possible to do that, we will be frank and open and honest with workers. But uh, this uh, government is proud of its record in these industrial situations and we will continue to work hard to make sure that we are saving jobs and saving companies wherever we possibly can. Richard Leonard. Well, let me recap. Yesterday, a for sale sign. Tomorrow, more workers served with compulsory redundancy notices, and today, a meeting of the stakeholder group. Time is running out. The government has had six months to take decisive action. I raised this with the First Minister back in February. I wrote to the Transport Secretary just yesterday. These works have existed in Springburn for 160 years, but once it goes, it goes forever. The site's turnover is up. The workers' skills are indispensable. This is a cornerstone of Scotland's engineering base. This is a national asset. So, First Minister, will you act in the national interest? Will you instruct the Cabinet Secretary for Transport to purchase the site, save these jobs before it's too late? First Minister. Look, I, I'd say this to Richard Leonard. Uh, genuinely, given the track record of this government in situations similar to this, of stepping in where we can, of purchasing sites where we can, of coming up with funding arrangements to facilitate the purchase of sites by other companies, uh, given that track record, given our uh, proven determination to save jobs and save companies where we can, if it is the case that that is not possible in this uh, or other circumstances, then perhaps Richard Leonard might conclude that there might be a good reason for that, given the overall responsibilities of this government to the taxpayer. So we will continue to discuss with the unions. The, the Transport Secretary is doing that later. We are happy to have any and all discussions with the companies. And we will continue to take whatever action we can in situations like this. Uh, but we will do that taking account of all of our responsibilities, because that's what responsible government has to do. We've got three constituency uh, supplementaries. The first from Liam MacArthur, to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister, we are aware of the ongoing industrial action affecting airports across the Highlands and Islands. She will also recognise the significant disruption this action has caused and continues to cause on lifeline routes serving Orkney and other communities across the region. Does she therefore share my disappointment at news yesterday that a further strike is now due to take place on 12th June? Does she regret that this decision coincided with Hyal confirming it was tabling a revised offer to staff? And will she ensure that Transport Scotland now allow this revised offer to be put to staff as soon as possible so that this long-running and damaging dispute can be brought to an end? First Minister. Well, can I um, share Liam MacArthur's disappointment that this industrial action uh, has taken place and that uh, there is the prospect of further action? Uh, HIAL, of course, is covered by public sector pay policy. The policy sets parameters within which Highlands and Islands Airport can negotiate a pay settlement with its recognised unions. I understand that HIAL is meeting the unions again next week, and I hope it will be possible uh, to come to an agreement that averts uh, any possibility of further strike action. So I would encourage HIAL to continue to talk to the unions uh, to bring this dispute uh, to a resolution as quickly as possible. 
Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Neil Bibby. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, yesterday I was informed that 48 jobs are to go at Ecolab in Selkirk, and this will be a big uh, blow to the town. I, was, I would like to ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government will give to workers facing redundancies and their families at this challenging and worrying time. First Minister. Well, I share the concerns uh, about the news of these redundancies at Ecolab. Uh, I will ask the Economy uh, Minister to make contact with the company to look at uh, whether there is uh, support that the Scottish Government or Scottish Enterprise can offer to avert these redundancies. If that is not possible, uh, then our PACE initiative, of course, as it always does in these circumstances, will offer assistance directly to individual uh, workers. And I'm sure once he's had the opportunity to speak to the uh, company, the Economy Minister will be happy uh, to talk to the member further uh, in order to update her on what action is possible for the Scottish Government to take. Neil Bibby. Earlier this year, the Lord Advocate asked the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit to examine the Craig McClellan case, preparing the ground for a possible fatal accident inquiry into his death. As the First Minister is aware, Craig McClellan was killed in an unprovoked knife attack, killed by a man who had broken an electronic tag and had been on the run for months. The family were told that the Lord Advocate would make a decision on whether to order a fatal accident inquiry once an appeal by the man convicted of Craig's murder had been dealt with. That appeal was refused last week. Does the First Minister agree that there's now no good reason to delay a decision on this case any further? And for the sake of Craig's family and the public interest, surely the time has come for an independent fatal accident inquiry into the failures that led to this tragic murder. First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, can I take this opportunity today to convey again my sincere condolences to the family of Craig McClellan. None of us uh, can begin to imagine uh, what they have and continue to go through. Uh, now that the appeal is concluded, uh, I know that the Lord Advocate will be considering uh, the issue of a fatal accident inquiry. As the member is aware, decisions on fatal accident inquiries are for the law officers to take completely independently of ministers and therefore it would be wrong for me to express any opinion on that but I will ensure the Lord Advocate is made aware uh, of the question that Neil Bibby has asked here today and I will ask the Lord Advocate to correspond directly uh, with him as a result of that. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Across the United Kingdom, parties backing Remain outpolled those backing Leave. The momentum is with us. Our chances of stopping Brexit are higher than ever. Yet the First Minister chose this moment to introduce an independent referendum bill that divides the Remain parties in Scotland. Her minister didn't even mention a people's vote in yesterday's statement. Why cut and run when we are on the edge of victory? First Minister. Firstly, can I say to Willie Rennie, thank you for pointing out the fact that the SNP won the European elections in Scotland. Our best, ever, our best ever result in a European election, winning 50% uh, of the seats. Uh, can I secondly say to Willie Rennie, I think, uh, although I stand to be corrected if I'm getting this wrong, I think he's factually inaccurate to say that Mike Russell didn't mention a people's uh, vote in his statement yesterday. I, uh, I think he did uh, mention a second EU referendum. Uh, the SNP supports a second EU referendum, and I think there now is an opportunity to bring together all of those who support that uh, and try to secure that outcome. It will be helped enormously, of course, if Labour, not just in Scotland, but at a UK level, get off the fence and back that outcome as well. Uh, but, you know, the thing about Willie Rennie's position here is this. He believes Brexit will be a disaster. I agree with him on that. He thinks that the UK should have a chance to reverse Brexit through a second referendum. I agree with that as well. Uh, but here's where we differ. He thinks that if the UK doesn't take the option of reversing Brexit, Scotland should just have to accept that disaster and become a passive yeah. casualty of it. I don't agree with that. I think Scotland should have the right to choose a different future. I believe Scotland should have the right to choose an independent future as a European nation. Really ready. But, but Nicola Sturgeon's election letter to me addressed Dear Edna <laughs> didn't mention independence. That was funny. She's at it again. She is desperate for the UK to fail 
so she can push independence once again. She's even named a date, but the, moment, the momentum is with Remain. Speaker John Berko will block a no-deal Brexit. The Chancellor will bring down any no-deal Prime Minister. Boris Johnson is in court for telling lies. For goodness sake, even Richard Leonard is backing a people's vote. What more does she need? Be positive. Come with me. Fight to win a people's vote. Or once again, will she pursue independence no matter what happens? First Minister. Sorry, if I can uh, take a minute to stop laughing before I answer uh, Willie Rennie's. I I'm not sure I want to follow him from uh, the 38% of the vote that we got in the European elections to the, what, 12% that the Liberal Democrats have scored, which I have to say was an improvement, so well done uh, to them for that. <laughs> Alec Cole Hamilton 14. is pointing out it was 14. I still don't want to end up there if you don't uh, mind. But Willie Rennie did say that he hoped in the chamber I would take the opportunity to call him Edna. So all I can say is be careful what you wish for. Uh, what is it? Always a dame. Uh, <laughs> but on this issue, I think Willie Rennie, frankly, is being a bit complacent about the risk of a no-deal Brexit. Um, I hope uh, fervently there is not a no-deal Brexit. Uh, but given the direction of the Conservative Party, I don't think we can afford to be complacent about that at all. Uh, so we will continue to argue for a people's vote. We will continue to argue for the revocation of Article 50 as an alternative to no-deal Brexit. We will work with whoever across the political spectrum to bring that about. Uh, but if we don't succeed on that, and I hope we do succeed, if we don't succeed, I am not prepared to allow Scotland to sink with this ship. I want Scotland to have an alternative. I want Scotland to have a better future, a future as an independent European country. Thank you. We have some further supplementary questions. The first from Jenny Gilbruth, to be followed by Monica Lennon. Jenny Gilbruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's report from the Commons Home Affairs Select Committee says that the UK settlement scheme for EU citizens risks another windrush. Is this not a salutary warning that we should not be making EU citizens have to apply to remain in their home? And further, have the Tories learnt nothing from last week's election, that their hostility towards immigrants was roundly and rightly rejected? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I think from most of what they've had to say in the last few days, uh, certainly the Scottish Tories have learned uh, nothing at all from the fact that they have uh, been pushed into fourth place in Scotland in these elections. But, you know, carry on. Uh, the longer they fail to learn these lessons, the better for those of us on these benches uh, is what uh, I say. But Jenny Gilruth raises a really serious issue. Uh, Windrush was a scandal. I think even the Tories would concede that. And what European nationals are now being put through of having to apply for the right to continue to live here in their own country um, is shocking, but also at risk of repeating that scandal. Uh, they should not be being put through that. Uh, this is their home and they should be able to stay here. And we should all continue to argue against these measures and continue to send the clearest possible message uh, that those who choose to make this country their home are welcome here and we want them to stay. Monica Lennon to be followed by Gillian Martin. Monica Thank Lennon. Thank you. A Unison survey of Scottish ambulance service staff has found that extra resource for the service is not keeping up with demand. Over 7 out of 10 staff feel their team budget has been cut. And last year, there was a 30% increase in paramedics signed off work with stress and depression. I've been in touch with Unison this week, uh, First Minister, and they're rightly calling for urgent action. What will the government do and will the Health Secretary meet with Unison as a matter of priority? First Minister. Uh, well, the Health Secretary will always be happy to meet with trade unions to discuss these issues. Uh, we, of course, value the job that our ambulance service staff do in what are exceptionally challenging circumstances. Our ambulance service continues to be one of the best performing services uh, in the UK, despite continuous increased demand. Uh, and of course, it also services some of the most rural and remote parts of the country. We've invested almost £900 million in the ambulance service in the last four years, and we are committed to supporting the training of an additional 1,000 paramedics over the course of the Parliament. Uh, and this will build on the almost 18% rise in ambulance service staff over the last uh, decade. Uh, and lastly, the ambulance service itself is currently 
currently carrying out a national review of demand and capacity uh, and staff side partners including uh, Unison should be and I believe are fully involved in this work uh, as part of the demand and capacity <laughs> implementation group so these issues will continue to be uh, taken extremely seriously. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to ask the First Minister how proposed legislation on female genital mutilation will increase protection for women and girls. First Minister. Okay, I thank Gillian Martin for raising this issue. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have now introduced the Female Genital Mutilation Protection and Guidance Bill, which will increase the protections for women and girls. The new legislation is a very important step in the government's efforts to make Scotland equally safe for women and girls. It creates a new protection order to protect women and girls who may be victims of or at risk of FGM and ensures ministers issue statutory guidance to public bodies to improve their response to FGM. Uh, this bill, of course, is part of our wider work through the implementation of our National Action Plan on ending FGM, which focuses on prevention, protection from harm and provision of services for women and girls. But I hope uh, the bill will attract the support of members from right across the chamber. And question number four, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to investigate the disenfranchisement of EU nationals who were denied their vote at the recent EU elections. First Minister. <clears throat> Well, the number of EU nationals who appear to have been denied the vote in the European elections last week is nothing short of disgraceful. Uh, these are people who live and work here. This is their home. They had as much right to vote as any of the rest of us. Uh, the issues that arose were clearly a result of insufficient preparation time because of the prevarication over Brexit and a failure to address the uh, concerns raised by the Electoral Commission following the European elections in 2014. Uh, the fact that the UK Government appears to have taken no action to address this matter is unacceptable. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Constitutional Relations wrote to the UK Government in advance of the election warning that this could happen and he has now written again uh, calling for a full investigation to take place into this issue. Gail Ross. I thank the First Minister for her answer. In yesterday's statement, the Cabinet Secretary said that the proposed franchise for any future referendum would rightly include EU citizens and 16 and 17-year-olds. To save confusion or mistakes reoccurring in the future, surely this must be the standard for all elections. So will the First Minister continue to press the UK Government to adopt this system at Westminster or even better, put full control for holding democratic votes in the hands of this parliament. First Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree that we should do the latter, uh, but uh, short of that, I do think that 16 and 17 year olds and EU nationals should have the right to vote in all elections in Scotland. Um, we also, as Mike Russell said yesterday, and as will be covered in separate legislation, we want to extend the right to vote to anybody who is legally resident in this country, regardless of what country uh, they come from. Uh, I think that is fair and a sign of the open, inclusive, progressive country that we want to be. So we will continue to press the UK government on these matters. Uh, but I don't think we should lose sight of what happened Last week, uh, I will not have been the only one who spoke to people at polling stations who had been denied the right to vote. I spoke to one constituent who was almost in tears uh, and felt that this was the final straw of all of the stress and anxiety that he had gone through over the past uh, three years. So there should be an investigation into this uh, and any necessary steps should be taken to make sure that this disgrace is never allowed to happen again. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, like many in the Chamber, also had constituents denied the right to vote despite having filled in the appropriate UC1 form. I don't have such faith in the Westminster investigation. I note what the Cabinet Secretary has done. Can I ask if the Government would consider opening some kind of contact point for um, citizens in Scotland or EU citizens to register with us if they were unable to vote so if the UK Government doesn't find out the numbers? We do. First Minister. We will certainly give that consideration. Of course, as Christine Graham will be aware, we have established uh, an advice line for EU nationals uh, seeking to apply for the right to remain here uh, after Brexit. So it may be that we can do something similar to allow people who were denied the right to vote to register that fact, uh, which would give us uh, the opportunity to understand the scale of it. So Mike Russell's, I see, noting it down, I will ask him to explore that possibility and report back to Christine Graham once we've had the opportunity to do so. And question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report by Age Scotland that four in ten people requiring substantial or critical care were found to be waiting more than six weeks to receive it. First Minister. 
Uh, well, everybody in Scotland, uh, or people in Scotland generally, are enjoying longer lives. With that uh, often comes more complex needs, uh, which means demand for social care is growing, uh, underlying why we have already legislated for and introduced integration of health and social care. Age Scotland's report finds that the average waiting time between assessment and receipt of care for those in most need is around three weeks, but we want to go further to ensure that care is provided swiftly for all. That's why we're developing a programme of national support for local reform of adult social care, and it's why we will deliver £711 million uh, pounds of additional direct investment in social care and integration this year. That's an increase of 29% on last year's investment. Jamie Green. Uh, thank the First Minister for that response. You talked about the average time being three weeks. The last time Age Scotland monitored this, it was two and a half weeks. So that number is actually going up. So it's an interesting uh, statistic to measure against. Many of us in this chamber will be dealing with casework, with constituents who are spending weeks or even months in hospital taking up valuable bed space because their local authority cannot provide care packages either through a lack of finance, a lack of care home space or a lack of staff to provide in-home uh, in care. The report by Age Scotland confirms that since 2011 the number of care home places in Scotland has dropped by over 1,000. This independent report is titled Is Scotland Meeting Its Commitment to Older People? The report clearly doesn't think so. What does the First Minister think? First Minister. Well, of course, more people now are being cared for at home uh, than would have been the case previously. But there are many important messages in the Age Scotland report, and we will study them carefully. I think the actions we are already taking are the right ones. We have integrated health and social care. And of course, as I said in my original answer, we are increasing the direct investment in social care and integration. There was also uh, a report out yesterday that the member may have seen uh, from the Health Foundation uh, that reported that Scotland spends uh, the most money on social care per head uh, than of any country in the UK. Uh, we are spending 43% uh, more than England and 33% more than Wales. So the investment is there and that is important. Uh, but we need to make sure that services are working in the right uh, joined up way to ensure that the care is there for older people when they need it. And we are determined uh, to continue to make the progress that requires to be made there because as the member rightly points out, that of course is one of the factors that then has a knock-on effect on our efforts to get acute hospital waiting times down as well. David Stewart to be followed by George Adam. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Age Scotland report suggested that there was limited or patchly monitoring across local authorities of how long people were waiting for the social care or the reasons for delays. Does the First Minister think this is acceptable and will she accept the recommendations from Age Scotland that more regular data collection on social care is required? First Minister. Uh, we will listen carefully to all of the recommendations that Age Scotland uh, makes. Uh, we do want to make sure that there is uh, good data and also consistent data. There is uh, already uh, a lot of data, for example, on delayed discharges, but uh, it is important that we have the, the wealth of data to make sure that we can assess whether the actions we're taking are succeeding or not. So we will give due consideration to that recommendation, as we will to uh, all of the other recommendations in the report. George Adam, followed by Alec Rowley. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister has already mentioned uh, the, the analysis produced by the Health Foundation that highlighted that public spending care for elderly and disabled is as much as 43% higher in Scotland than south of the border, where the Tories are in control. Now, while we can have legitimate concerns and, and these could, should be addressed, does the First Minister not see this as hypocrisy from the Conservative Party and a reflection of where the two government's pri priorities actually lie? First Minister. Well, I'm, of course, responsible for the actions of this government, and we are prioritising uh, the actions that are required to make the improvements here that we all want to see. Uh, we have already integrated health uh, and social care. Um, the UK government's green paper on social care was first promised 812 days ago. And yet there's no sign of it being published. And as I referred to earlier on, Matt Hancock told a committee uh, last month that it was delayed because of Brexit. We're getting on uh, with that work. We're also spending proportionately more money on social care than uh, other countries in the UK. All of that is positive. But as the Age Scotland report points out, there is still work to be done and progress to be made. And we are determined to get on and make it. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, many social care providers are struggling when it comes to staff, retention and recruitment. And part of the problem may well be Brexit, but a big part of the problem is that in some parts, 
of the care sector. Workers are paid poor terms and paid poor wages, poor terms and conditions. Should there not be equal pay across the whole of the care sector? Should a carer not be valued whether they are delivering that care through a private company or through a public company? First Minister. Um, yes, I agree with that. Of course, this government uh, has invested to introduce the living wage for workers in social care, and we are pursuing and will continue to pursue providers who are not passing that on, whether they are private sector providers or indeed local authority providers, because we want the social care workforce uh, to be valued for the, the job that they do, which is a vital, tough and challenging job. Uh, but uh, as Alec Rowley rightly says, uh, Brexit is a big issue here, and if you talk to uh, any social care provider, they will say that one of the biggest worries they have is about access to the skills and labour that they need uh, to provide these services, which is why uh, it is so important that we try to come together to stop Brexit uh, and that we come together to stop this current approach that the UK government is taking to immigration, which is damaging not just our economy, but the very fabric of our public services as well. Question number six, Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Poverty and Inequality Commission's recent finding that the current level of spending directed at tackling poverty in Scotland is falling well short of what is needed. First Minister. Uh, the Commission's report is a timely reminder of the challenge we face in undoing the damage of UK Government welfare cuts, austerity and the impacts of Brexit, all issues that, of course, were highlighted in the UN Special Rapporteur's report last week. Uh, Scotland is facing a reduction of £3.7 billion in annual social security spending by 2021 as a result of UK government cuts. Uh, the Scottish Government is investing over £125 million to mitigate the worst impacts of these cuts uh, in this year alone. Uh, and of course, we're also taking forward our own policies to tackle poverty and inequality, which includes uh, in this year an extra £385 million to support our expansion of childcare, at least £351 million in our council tax reduction scheme and around £435 million in direct assistance through social security measures as was set out at the budget. Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for her response. I think we all know the damage that uh, Tory austerity and cuts is doing, but it's the First Minister's policies that I would like to talk about. There is a consensus amongst numerous anti-poverty organisations, including the Government's Poverty and Inequality Commission, uh, to call for urgent action on the introduction of the income supplement. And as the head of Oxfam Scotland said, warm words will not make a difference to people who cannot put food on the table. So can the First Minister offer more than warm words today to those in need of the income supplement right now? Will she bring it forward or will she tell us what interim measures she will put in place? After all, in this chamber in March, can I remind the First Minister that she promised us an update before the end of June? First Minister. Well, it's, if I can point out, it is just now the end of May. There will be an update before the end of June, but we're not in June uh, yet. And that indeed is, is the answer that I've given to Richard Leonard. We will bring forward an update on our plans for the income supplement in June uh, because we are looking at how uh, we would introduce that in a way that lifts the maximum number of children out of poverty. And of course, we've got to uh, look at the mechanisms we need to put in place to practically deliver that. So that update will come in June and of course, uh, it will be open for discussion across the parliament. We will continue to take our responsibilities seriously. Child poverty in Scotland is too high, but it is lower than it is in any other part of the UK, which I think is a reflection of the seriousness with which uh, this government treats it and the policies we are implementing. Uh, the Best Start grant, for example, that is not being implemented in any other part of the UK. So we will continue to do that. But we should also all come together and maybe um, as part of their post-election reflections over the next few weeks, Labour will consider uh, belatedly joining the Scottish Government in asking for all welfare policies to come to this Parliament so that we can tackle these causes at root, rather than continuing to have to apply sticking plasters to the policies of Tory governments that we don't vote for. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the benchmarks of our society in Scotland is that we are opening and welcoming and that we take our responsibility to refugees extremely seriously. Can the First Minister outline what benefits the Cabinet Secretary for um, Social Security's announcements yesterday will make for asylum seekers in tackling poverty? 
First Minister. Well, can I say how delighted I am, and uh, all credit uh, to Shirley Ann Somerville for this, that we are uh, able now to uh, apply the Best Start grant to uh, refugee and asylum seekers who have children. Uh, we had to discuss that with the UK government, given their policy of not allowing people in uh, those categories access to public funds. But we uh, want our policies to benefit anybody in poverty and in need in Scotland. We shouldn't judge people uh, on the basis of where they come from. We should judge people on uh, the fact that they are citizens of Scotland and all citizens of Scotland deserve the help that this government is determined to give them to lift children out of poverty. And Keith Brown. Uh, can I ask the First Minister whether she agrees that her government would have much greater resources to tackle poverty in Scotland on top of everything else it does, and which it does not because it's allowed, but because it's the right thing to do, if it didn't have to mitigate the worst effects of Tory austerity to the tune of hundreds of millions of pounds? Here, here. First Minister. Well, obviously, if we didn't have Tory austerity, then we wouldn't have the levels of poverty that we have and we wouldn't have the cuts to our budget that is making it harder uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, of course, we also have a Conservative Party in this chamber. You know, they are bereft of policies, but the one policy they have managed to come forward with in recent years is to give tax cuts to the richest, which would take yeah. half a billion pounds out of public services and tackling poverty in this country. So the lesson of that uh, in the short term is not to listen to the advice of the Scottish Tories. Uh, the lesson in the medium uh, to longer term is that we should uh, get out of a position in Scotland uh, where Tory politicians think that what we can do is a matter of what they allow us to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And instead, what we do in Scotland is a matter of the choice of the people of our country. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Oh, a, a point of order first from Mr Russell and then from Elaine Smith. Mr Russell. Presiding officer, I know you are uh, very keen to draw the distinction between opinion and fact in this chamber, but when something is demonstrably untrue, I'm sure you would guide the chamber on how quickly it should be corrected. I have checked the official report, and yesterday in my statement I said, and I quote, the Scottish Government and the SNP at Westminster will do all they can to stop Brexit for the whole UK. In particular, they will continue to support a second referendum on EU membership. Given that, given that the leader of the Liberal Democrats made an assertion that that was, I did not say that yesterday, perhaps you could advise him on how quickly he could correct the record. Thank, thank you very much. I think all members are aware of the various mechanisms that are available if they wish to correct the record. However, the point that Mr Russell, the point that Mr Russell himself, Mr Russell himself, Mr Russell himself has alerted everybody in the chamber to what was said yesterday very accurately. Uh, can I call Elaine Smith on a point of order? Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And in terms of the various mechanisms for correcting the record and under our standing orders and code of conduct, obviously there are ways to do that. Could I just do it right now? Because earlier I was reading out from the 28th of March official report, but my excuse is it is very small type on this. Um, and what it says is, the First Minister said, we will bring forward the update before June. So I read it out wrong. It's not before the end of June. It's before June, which gives us one day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Points of order. Excuse me. Points of order are for the chair, not for members to respond to. Uh, I would thank Elaine Smith for correcting uh, and for informing the Chamber of the correct entry from the official report, and the members will have noted that. And on that note, we'll finish on uh, First Minister's questions, and we'll move to members' business in a moment in the name of Gordon MacDonald. Uh, but before we do, we'll have a short suspension to allow members, the Minister and some members of the gallery to change seats. A short suspension.